All right. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us here today. Um, so we'll get started. I'd like to request everyone to put their phones on silent. All right. So good evening. Thank you, everyone, for taking the time to attend this event and for braving the polluted Delhi air to join us here today. So this is a session on inclusive and sustainable growth in South Asia with a particular focus on India. So today's session will have two paper presentations back to back based on IMF papers, followed by comments by our discussants, followed by question and answer from the audience. So, but first I'd like to invite on stage Dr. Lewis E. Brewer, who is a senior resident representative for India, Nepal, and Bhutan at the IMF uh, to give his introductory remarks. Dr. Brewer. Thank you very much for being here and to Brookings India for housing this event. It's a real pleasure for us to do things with uh, Brookings. Uh, an important center of thinking and knowledge in India. Uh, my name is Luis Brewer. I'm the IMF representative in your country. And as you know, the I, probably the IMF basically does three things. It lends money to countries that have external difficulties. And in Asia, we have programs with Sri Lanka and Mongolia. It, provides technical cooperation in very sort of specialized areas such as tax collection, supervising banks, monetary policy, and so forth. We have uh, recently opened a large capacity development center in Delhi called SARTAC, which serves South Asian countries, six countries, uh, Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, uh, India, and the uh, Maldives. And the third main activity of the fund, as you may know, is policy dialogue and policy advice to countries. And we normally have an annual consultation uh, with member countries. The one with India will take place on November 25th at the board, the executive board of the IMF. And in the context of engaging in policy advice and policy dialogue with countries, the fund undertakes quite a bit of analytical work, research work, to try to understand regional economies, country economies, and support the advice that we give. And in that context, it's really a privilege for us to launch this uh, publication, Is South Asia Ready for Takeoff, which refers to South Asia. And there are some copies available outside that you are welcome to uh, get a copy. And in this particular case, we are linking the launch of this publication with some research done in the context of the World Economic Outlook, which the IMF publishes every six months or so, uh, analyzing the global economy. And in this latest issue, published just a few days ago in late October, one of the chapters of that publication was about what has happened to structural reforms in recent years, both in emerging and developing countries. And because this is quite integrated into the work on South Asia, it, Giovanni, who's the author of that chapter of the wheel, will also be talking about structural reforms in emerging markets. Again, thank you very much for being here. It's a big honor for us to present this here, and I hope that you have lots of questions and that you will ultimately learn a thing or two from these presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Breer. So we'll start with our presentation based on two IMF papers. The first paper is titled, Is South Asia Ready for Takeoff? a sustainable and inclusive growth agenda, and it will be presented by Dr. Manuela Goretti. She is the Deputy Division Chief in the Asia and Pacific Department of the International Monetary Fund. Since February 2018, she is the IMF Mission Chief for Sri Lanka. She has a PhD in economics from Warwick University in the UK. 
The second paper, titled Reigniting Growth in Emerging Market and Low-Income Economies, What Role for Structural Reforms? This will be presented by Dr. Giovanni Malina. He is an economist in the research department of the IMF. Before joining the fund, he worked as an associate professor of macroeconomics at the City University London after obtaining his PhD in economics from Burbank University of London. Our discussants for the day are Dr. Anne-Marie Guild. She's the Deputy Director, Asia Pacific Department of IMF. She holds a PhD in International Economics from the Graduate Institute of International Studies in Geneva, Switzerland. Her publications focus on exchange rate regimes, financial stability, and development issues. We look forward to your incisive remarks, Dr. Guild. Mr. A.K. Bhattacharya, he is the Editorial Director of Business Standard. He has formerly edited the Economic Times and the Pioneer. He graduated from Hindu College, University of Delhi. We look forward to your analytical take on today's presentation, Mr. Bhattacharya. Our third discussant for the day, Dr. Mudit Kapoor, who is an Associate Professor of Economics at the Indian Statistical Institute in New Delhi. He holds a PhD in economics from University of Maryland in College Park, USA. He has undertaken extensive research on the topics of development economics, including health, financial inclusion, gender, and political economy. This session will be chaired by Dr. Rahul Tongya. He's a fellow here with Brookings India. He's also an adjunct instructor at Carnegie Mellon University and a member of the World Economic Forum uh, Global Future Council on Advanced Energy Technology. His work focuses on technology policy, especially for sustainable development. So without further ado, I'd like to begin today's presentation with Manuela's presentation. Yes. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks so much for having us uh, here today to launch uh, uh, this paper in South Asia uh, ready for, uh, for takeoff, um, a sustainable inclusive growth agenda. The paper is a joint effort by a team of the uh, Asian Pacific Department of the IMF under the guidance of our Deputy Director, Marie Goldewolf. Uh, so before I start with the presentation, maybe let me just address the first question, which is probably in your mind, is why this paper? Um, we, we look at uh, um, India and South Asia, and uh, what we find is that uh, despite the recent slowdown, uh, there is a growth potential uh, which is very important in the region, which uh, could uh, set it to be a growth pole uh, going forward over the medium to longer term, not just for Asia, but uh, for, uh, for the global economy. So it, we thought it was very important to uh, look back to the growth history of the region and start and try to understand the, the key drivers of growth and also to think uh, ahead over the long term to the key opportunities uh, uh, for this uh, group of countries. Uh, as uh, Luis mentioned earlier, um, the grouping we are looking at when we discuss South Asia, um, it's the grouping of uh, the Asian Pacific Department, uh, and in particular, um, uh, the Asian Pacific Department monitors uh, um, six countries in South Asia. These are India, uh, Bangladesh, Bup Bhutan, Nepal, Maldives, and uh, Sri Lanka. So when uh, I will refer to South Asia in the presentation, I will be referring to these six uh, countries in particular. So we can start. So let me walk you briefly through uh, the flow of the presentation. Uh, as I mentioned, we would like to start looking briefly back to the South Asia growth history. Uh, and, and this one to use it to basically as a leverage to look what are the key areas that we can build on uh, going forward. Uh, in particular, uh, we'll discuss some of the key challenges we identify for the region, including for India. And uh, rather than looking at a specific solution, what we find in the paper is more a range of different policy options that we believe would be important uh, to sustain growth over the long term. And uh, we will present towards the end uh, um, a, some modeling simulation to see how this uh, reform scenario could play out over the long term. So if uh, we start from uh, uh, looking at South Asia growth performance over the last decades, uh, uh, we can try to draw some uh, lessons uh, um, for the future going forward. Uh, 
and indeed uh, um, growth in the, uh, in the South Asia region has taken deeper roots in recent decades. Uh, up to the 1970s, India and uh, some of their neighbor countries uh, were characterized by this very um, steady and low uh, growth trajectory, which was uh, always around 3 to 4 percent and didn't really seem to take off. But uh, um, with the liberalization of the economies in most of these countries in the 80s and the 90s, uh, we, um, we witnessed a, a real takeoff of this economy with growth averaging 7 percent on average for the region as a whole. And uh, importantly, um, we, we, we saw that uh, uh, the, the reforms uh, were uh, associated with this very strong uh, performance. While, uh, uh, if you look at the left chart, uh, well, uh, um, you, you can see that, for example, if we compare the, uh, the development path of India and Bangladesh, uh, it is comparable to that one of other ASEAN countries, like uh, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, or the Philippines. Uh, however, it is not uh, as uh, dramatic as they take off at the similar stage of development uh, of uh, countries like Korea or China. Yet, we, what we do witness is uh, um, a robust, robust growth dynamics uh, uh, thanks to these ongoing uh, reform efforts. Uh, um, importantly also, uh, we see a dramatic decrease in uh, poverty levels across, uh, across the region. And of course, the impact is uh, uh, more striking in countries like Nepal, India, and Bangladesh, uh, since uh, some of the other countries in the region were already uh, starting from higher income levels. So the Im impact on the population of these uh, reform efforts and growth performance over the last two decades uh, uh, has been significant. So what does this mean? Uh, going forward. Um, what we decide to focus in the paper uh, is uh, um, how can the region deliver job-rich growth? Uh, and the reason is uh, uh, this region hosts one-fifth of the global population. So it has a very big task at hand. Uh, and uh, um, this is why the emphasis on, on jobs uh, and employment is particularly relevant. Uh, South Asia is uh, uh, the youngest and the most densely populated uh, um, uh, countries, and uh, uh, the median age uh, is less than 27 years. Uh, the working age population is uh, expected to increase in the region over the next 20 years, compared to other countries uh, in, uh, in Asia where uh, there, is, the, there is no longer a positive demographic dividend. And uh, uh, based on our projection, uh, which rely on the, um, the estimates by the UN population prospects, uh, more than 150 million people will enter uh, the labor force in the region. And of these, uh, 130 million alone uh, will be entering the labor force in India. If uh, we look at the growth strategies that other countries, including peer countries in Asia, have followed, uh, uh, in the past. Uh, these were, uh, they tended to be uh, focused on a combination of export-oriented uh, strategies and manufacturer-led um, kind of industrial policies. Now, when we look at the global environment today, we, uh, we realize that uh, um, this type of, uh, of strategy might not be as relevant as it used to be in the past. And indeed, even uh, countries like, you know, what used to be the Asian Tigers or China are, re are re rethinking and revisiting uh, this approach. Um, here we just uh, illustrated in these two charts two key points. One is uh, concerning the possibility to simply rely on export-led growth. We see that there is a structurally weaker growth in advanced economy at about 2%. So there is a need of course to support export-led growth, but also there is a need to look internally to domestic demand in India and in other countries. The second issue is uh, uh, automation. Increasing automation is leading to dislocation of the labor force. So a strategy that relies entirely on manufacturing might not be a winning strategy, especially over the longer term. So what uh, um, we present in the paper is a solution, as I said at the beginning, that it doesn't focus on uh, a single strategy, but more on a balanced, multi approach with, of different policy options, which rely on all the sectors of the economy in a balanced and sustainable way. So first, uh, 
improving agricultural productivity. Um, we find that it would be very important for India and other countries in the region to advance the productivity of the agricultural sector that remains relatively low. And this will in turn allow to support their allocation of resources to other um, dynamic segments of the economy, but also at the same time by improving the sector productivity also reduce rural distress in, uh, with farmers in, in the agricultural sector. Uh, second, um, I think it would be very important to continue to rely on services uh, as a key driver of growth, uh, especially in India where the, uh, the service sector performance has been especially remarkable. Um, and this is important despite the fact that, as you can see on the right hand, uh, right -hand chart, uh, the, um, the payout in terms of jobs from, uh, from services is significantly lower than that one in terms of manufacturing. But this is still an area where productivity growth is very strong and there is uh, extremely high potential, especially in the high-skilled services. And third, so last but not least, uh, there is a need also to expand manufacturing. Compared to other um, countries in the region, South Asia relies on a very low level of manufacturing, both in terms of value added and exports. Uh, the average ex exports account for only 8% of GDP in the region, and actually this average is brought up by Bangladesh, where, which has a much uh, um, greater production at about 14%. And uh, um, how to approach manufacturing in a way that is uh, uh, sustainable from a uh, different angle, including uh, uh, the environment. And when you look at the quality ladder of the manufacturing production in the region, uh, we see that there is significant uh, scope to um, affect some quality upgrades with, within existing product baskets, uh, together with effort to improve skilled labor and facilitate labor mobility. So this could be possibly a way to start expanding manufacturing in the, in the region. So um, while policy, of course, are country specific and uh, each country uh, in South Asia has its own specific circumstances and characteristics, uh, we try to identify some key common themes uh, that could apply to the region as a whole. And, uh, um, and try to identify what could be bolder but also safer reforms that uh, this country could uh, embark upon. Uh, if somebody can cl click for me, I can give you the oh, sign. We use the old, old school <laughs> system. So next. Okay. So as you see, we have three blocks. Um, the first block uh, is uh, uh, what we call making policy space for reform. And here what we're really referring to is uh, ensuring macroeconomic and financial stability. Uh, this is because these are prerequisites for a stable and predictable economic environment that can su support other growth enhancing reform and in turn investment and growth. Next. Now, what does this mean? In what we find in the region uh, as a common pattern is that there is a pressing need to advance revenue-based fiscal consolidation. Uh, to lower high public debt and, uh, I, as I mentioned earlier, making space for critical spending in the areas that are more, most important for growth. Next. And at the same time, when we look at uh, South Asia, we find that uh, state-owned banks play an especially important role in financing both private and public investment in the region, also compared to peers. However, when we look at the literature, we find that uh, uh, when excessive reliance on state-owned banks and lending to public corporations uh, to finance investment can lead to important inefficiencies and lead to resource misallocation. So this seems an area that uh, um, countries in the region uh, should really need to tackle in order to uh, release resources to the productive segments of the economy. Mm -hmm. oh, now it works. Um, can you go back? Um, the second uh, uh, um, key policy areas uh, refers to supporting private sector in entrepreneurship. So um, what we look at is, for example, the areas of uh, trade and FDI liberalizations. Um, opening further to trade and uh, next, opening further to trade and FDI uh, can support diversification and further integrate uh, the, the region in the global economy. 
uh, there has been important progress in this area in, uh, in India and in other countries. Uh, but at the same time, when we look at the average tariff rates, uh, we see that they remain relatively high compared to peers. Uh, for the region as a whole, we're talking about 10% based on data as of 2016. And there are many more uh, non-tariff barriers that remain significant. Uh, uh, on the investment side, there are still uh, issues like caps in India, negative lists in Bhutan, uh, complex approval systems uh, in Nepal that constrain FDI. And uh, uh, as we see on the right-hand chart, uh, um, this has also resulted in a, a much lower integration into global value chains in India and other countries in the region compared to, to other peers uh, in Asia. Next. Another area to support private sector-led investment is, of course, also to improve the infrastructure. Um, and here we look both at uh, uh, the availability of infrastructure, but also its quality. Uh, at the same time, you know, as you know, we are uh, um, experiencing first hand in the last days, it is very important that uh, development in infrastructure investment is done sustainably. So from also in terms of an, uh, from an environmental perspective. Uh, and if you look at the right hand chart, we see that uh, many countries, not just India, for example, China is, a, is an obvious example, as they have in, in expanded their investment in percent of GDP, they have also increased dramatically the CO2 emissions uh, in, um, in the environment. Um, this reform should uh, go pari passo with uh, further development on the financial sector, which remain uh, relatively shallow in the region, and deeper capital markets, as well as governance reforms. Uh, these are discussed more at length in the paper, but for brevity, we haven't uh, included them in the presentation today. Uh, the next, uh, the, the last block, uh, which is as important, uh, um, is to achieve a sustainable but also inclusive growth strategy is investing in people. And here we mean really enabling uh, the workforce of the region, which as I mentioned is gonna be about the size of Mexico, Russia in terms of proportion, to really be up to speed with the challenges of the 21st century. Next. Now, investment in human capital has a very important yield in terms of growth. And when we look at the data for uh, uh, South Asia, uh, here we have data for uh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, India. What we find is that in terms of level uh, spending in education, they are pretty much comparable to other uh, uh, countries in Asia. Uh, but uh, the, the areas where we see more shortcomings are when you start looking more into the details and we assess issues like coverage, quality of education. And this applies from primary education to, depending on the country, to vocational training, so uh, the ability to match uh, skills uh, to, to jobs um, in the economy. Uh, also, there is a need of significant greater efforts in terms of research and development by both the public and the private sector. Next. Um, now, digital technology uh, offer a very important opportunities uh, to prepare the, the, the workforce. Uh, um, while there has been more and more digitalization, including in South Asia, uh, what we find is that a large share of the population, uh, especially in countries like uh, Bangladesh, Nepal, uh, Sri Lanka, but also India, uh, still lack internet access, which is a basic requirement, of course, uh, to, for having access to digital technology. Um, there is also a lot of uh, um, potential from, uh, in terms of growth that can be achieved through financial inclusion. And of course, this uh, can leverage on greater use of, uh, of, of fintech and new technology. Next. Uh, next, oh, okay. Um, when we look at the labor force also, uh, more emphasis uh, seems to be needed uh, a policy that aims to uh, um, achieve a, a greater economic empower of women. We, here we refer, for example, a greater use of flexible work arrangement, telework, again, uh, new technology can help in these areas, uh, uh, but also efforts to reduce skill mismatches, uh, whether it's uh, focusing more on STEM education for women or uh, vocational training. Um, Again, these efforts should also go, in, go hand in hand with uh, um, greater labor market flexibility uh, to, so that you can, we can tackle the 
relatively large level of informality in most of the South Asian countries. So, so I, I mentioned, the, um, we can move to the next slide. I mentioned these uh, three blocks of policy, but we thought it would be uh, more concrete to try to model, of course, in a more stylized way, what could be the impact of uh, a reform scenarios on these countries. Uh, for modeling and data availability purposes, uh, we focus on India and then reflected some of the results to the rest of the region. So if we can move to the next slide, I can show you uh, what uh, uh, the results look like. Just sip of water. <coughs> so our simulations are based on the IMF uh, Global Integrated Monetary and Fiscal Model. And uh, um, the model is applied to India. And we apply three different layers of uh, um, reforms, efforts to this scenario. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, the first layer, we reduce good tariffs in India from current levels to zero. Then, as a second layer, we substantially reduce non-tariff barriers uh, to trading services by 30%. <coughs> and third, we reduce the restriction in FDI to the global average level. The combined effect uh, that you can see in the, in the green bars uh, lead to an improvement in productivity and real GDP of 20% uh, in India over 20 years. If we um, basically reflect the substantial efforts in terms of uh, gains, in terms of real GDP, we are talking about an improvement of 100 trillion rupees uh, in real GDP in India uh, by 2040. But also importantly, there is uh, a significant improvement compared to our current baseline, which is what we publish in our World Economic Outlook, in terms of uh, living standards. So per capita income, real GDP per capita in, uh, in India uh, would raise to nearly 40,000 US dollars, which is roughly 45% uh, of, of the um, compared to the level of income in the, in the US. So even if under the baseline there is already um, inbuilt a very strong performance by the country uh, under the ongoing uh, scenario and ongoing policies, uh, this accelerated reform effort would uh, improve performance and living standards uh, even further. Uh, next. Now what we do next is uh, we uh, analyze using the IMF flexible system of global models, uh, which is calibrated for the Asia region, uh, what would be the spillovers to the rest of the world, the rest of Asia, and uh, the two countries included in the sample for South Asia, which are Bangladesh and Sri Lanka, uh, if India were to undertake this reform scenario. And we find that uh, the impact would be substantial, especially for the two countries in the region, over 3% of GDP. Uh, and this is, of course, due to two key factors, which are um, key assumptions in the model, uh, trade linkages, but also the ability for this country to have enhanced productivity from technology transfers. So the region as a whole would benefit not just India from uh, a stronger reform scenario. If we bring all these results together, as you can see in the next slide, Here what you can see is if you look at 2018, we have India alone contributing to about 15% of global growth. Now, if all the countries in South Asia were to pur pursue the same reform scenario that I just described, you can see that by uh, 2040, uh, the contribution to global growth could be um, almost 35%. So more than one third of global growth would come from India and, and the rest of South Asia, which is quite a remarkable result. Uh, in terms of real GDP growth, uh, how this number compare? So we have a baseline scenario, so which basically assumes that over the medium to long term, growth in India would be 6%. So still a quite a remarkable growth rate. But under the reform scenario, you would be able to lock in 6.5% growth compared to a lower um, downside scenario where the demographic dividend cannot really be um, fully exploited in terms of benefits, and growth would be only about 5%. Now, 
this is especially important at this juncture because we are seeing a slowdown in the global economy, including for, for India. So the benefit of uh, reforms uh, is even more pressing in this, uh, in this context. And uh, uh, Giovanni, my colleague, will uh, discuss specifically what is uh, the impact of uh, macrostructural reforms and, and growth uh, um, for emerging markets. So if you allow me to conclude this part of the presentation with the final slides, um, uh, the, the paper uh, in the conclusion touches on some of the key issues, so not just in terms of you know, what are the key policies that uh, the region can tackle, but also how can you create a reform momentum to you know, generate interest by the public, by the government in going ahead with this ambitious reform agenda. Now, what we find in the in the literature uh, at the IMF and the OECD has also work done in this area, is that uh, government have the best opportunity of implementing the reforms in the first two years they are in power. And this is because one, they have a fresh mandate, so they have a better opportunity to uh, tackle some of the most difficult issues, but also because reforms do take time to materialize uh, and bear fruit, so it's better to do it earlier on in the legislation rather than wait uh, before uh, new elections. Uh, so, of course, in, Saudi, in, in most South Asian economies, we have had uh, recent elections in Bangladesh, in India, and there are forthcoming elections, for example, in Sri Lanka. So, it seems that uh, we are at a propitious window of opportunity to accelerate the reform agenda. And again, this is also an opportunity to respond to the recent uh, slowdown in growth. Uh, of course, what we find is that it's very important to have clear communication to the public of the benefits of the reform, but also to prioritize them based on their macroeconomic impact uh, to make sure that, you know, you can, uh, for example, if you are in a, you know, a soft patch in your economy, you first tackle the reforms that uh, are, uh, have a less uh, uh, detrimental impact on the economy. And for those reforms that are more difficult and that would have a distributional impact, uh, it is critical to have well-targeted and stronger social safety nets. So that uh, while you are, uh, uh, you are being ambitious in your reform agenda, you make sure that uh, you are also protecting the most vulnerable segments of the populations. So um, let me conclude with these remarks. So basically, we see um, a strong opportunity for India and for the region to continue on, on their uh, um, successful uh, uh, growth performance of the last uh, two decades. And, uh, but of course, in order to do that, there is a need for an ambitious reform agenda, and there is a need to remain mindful of uh, fiscal, financial, and environmental risk. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Goretti, for a wonderful presentation. I now invite Dr. Melina to present his paper. No, that's not. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to present chapter three of the most recent World Economic Outlook. And this is an analytical chapter that was co-authored uh, co with a number of colleagues in the uh, research department uh, of the IMF. And it's on the effects of structural reforms on, uh, uh, on the macroeconomy in uh, a wider set of countries because we consider emerging market and low-income uh, countries. And uh, we thought that um, some of the uh, lessons that we draw from this more general analysis are still applicable to um, South Asia, and this is why we think that this is this complements the uh, the presentation that uh, Manuela has uh, just uh, done. So first of all, um, can we change slide? First of all. Um, uh, why did we write this uh, analytical chapter? Um, we uh, start from the observation that on average, uh, the speed of uh, per capita income convergence in uh, emerging and developing economies remains low. There was an acceleration in the average speed in the decade between 1998 and 2007, but in the past decade, it stalled, 
And a wide cross-country heterogeneity persists with an increased fraction of countries that are actually diverging instead of converging. But also regions like South Asia that manage to maintain quite a good speed of convergence. So our overarching question uh, is, could um, a big push to structural reforms boost growth and accelerate the convergence pro uh, process? So what are the specific questions that we ask in the chapter? The first is what was the evolution with reform progress over time and is there still a scope for reforms? The second question is what are the effects of structural reforms on important macroeconomic variables? And in particular, we look at six areas of the forms domestic and external finance, trade, product and labor market, and finally governance. And the third question is, how heterogeneous are the effects across time and across countries? Next slide, please. Okay. So the general trend in the initial part of the sample is of an increase in the reform effort over time with an acceleration in the 1990s. From the 2000s, we observe a plateau, especially in low-income countries. Most countries in South Asia followed this general pattern and made significant inroads uh, with structural reforms, but currently they score just below the median emerging and developing economy, and therefore this means that they still have ample scope for reform. Um, these are the average responses over time of output or employment to major reforms. And uh, the takeaway from this slide is that over the medium term, the average effects of reforms are sizable, but it takes some time for effects to materialize and to show statistical significance. So even if we abstract from potential complementarities among reforms, a major package of reforms in each area may raise GDP per capita by over 7% in six years. And this would essentially double the speed of convergence for some time in the average country. But these average effects hide important sources of heterogeneity. First, we condition the results upon the level of governance. And it turns out that for a majority of reforms, the effects are larger in countries with stronger governance and smaller, sometimes much smaller, like in the case of product market reforms, in countries with weak governance. In this area, South Asian economies score at or below the median, meaning that, meaning that there are still a lot of potential gains to be unlocked by packaging reforms in other areas with governance reforms. We perform a similar analysis, but this time we condition on the level of informality. And we find that for a majority of reforms, the effects are larger in countries with high level of informality. And the reason is that um, typically, reforms lower the level of informality. It, they boost formalization. So if the level of informality is high to start with, uh, then this additional channel on growth would be stronger. South Asian economies score medium high in the informality index, meaning that there are also gains to be unlocked from the boost coming from reforms to formalization. And also, model simulations confirm that there is potential for reform um, complementarities. Here, for example, we show the additional gains from packaging labor market reforms with dom domestic financial liberalization. And the mechanism works through the alleviation of financial constraints, which enhance the joint effects of the two reforms. And finally, the chapter shows that unless implemented in election years, uh, 
The political cost of reforms is negligible and statistically insignificant, both in terms of the vote share of the ruling coalition and in terms of probability of re-election. So this means that governments are better off implementing reforms early in their political mandate. This is relevant, as Manuela said, for South Asia, because recent and forthcoming elections in most countries offer a valuable window of opportunity to accelerate the reform agenda. So to conclude, we find a clear case for, for a structural reform push in South Asia, in line with the finding of the departmental paper. Past reform effort helped growth and convergence, but yet there is still um, scope for reforms in all areas. And the predicted um, payoffs from, from reforms are sizable, especially in economies with higher informality. But one has to get the timing and the packaging right. Reforms, we find that reforms are less politically costly when implemented at the beginning of the electoral mandate. So now seems a good time to build momentum given the recent and forthcoming elections in most of Asian economies. And also payoffs are higher if reforms are packaged with measures that alleviate binding constraints on growth. And we find that access to finance and governance are two important areas for the region. And as Manuela said, um, uh, reforms tend to be uh, more effective if important elements are not neglected, such as a clear communication strategy, their potential undesirable distributional consequences, and so the need to build safety nets, especially in case of labor market reforms, and sustainability from a fiscal, financial, and envir environmental point of view. Thank you, Dr. Molina, for a wonderful presentation. I now invite our panel of discussants to take their place on the podium. Um, yes, I think I'm audible. Uh, thank you, everyone. And I think they're going to mic everyone up, so it'll just take a minute. Um, we can catch our breath. And thank you for our presenters for speaking continuously for so long when the uh, air may get you a little out of breath, so thank you. Um, welcome everybody to uh, Brookings India. I'm Dr. Rahul Tongia, a scholar in technology and policy and sustainability. So I'm not trying to fill in for uh, my colleague, Dr. Shamika Ravi. We have in fact several uh, number of distinguished e economists and, and skilled economists. Uh, Dr. Rajesh Shadda is also with uh, uh, Bro Brookings. Uh, you've heard, of course, uh, thank you for uh, emceeing uh, Dr. Brahma and Prachi Singh. So there are several distinguished economists. I'm a systems sort of a person, excuse me. And I guess the real question that comes up, f f f you know, the panel <coughs> is at a systems level, growth rates can shift around. And of course, we, we, there's the old term, the Hindu rate of growth, which described the Indian one. But there's a small joke that's there in the energy world. Uh, fusion is the technology of the future and has remained so for the last 30 years. So growth is coming, the takeoff is coming, the question becomes when and under what conditions and why. And so hopefully these are some of the things that we can get into. I'm delighted. We've already heard the bios of our presenters, uh, Dr. Gulde, had, had Gulde, Gulde uh, Kapoor, and Mr. Bhattacharya. So let's just set some ground rules for the discussions. We try and keep it short and interactive. If somebody would like to follow up, they can sort of indicate it, because hopefully it's not just talking points per se, but more interactive. And then we'll open it up to the audience. I'll share some suggestions on how we can keep it smooth f f when it comes to the time for the audience. So we've seen the presentations, very rich. And of course, the material is there online now. The, the, the documents are public. But opening thoughts um, before we get into more specifics. Yes, I mean, if you uh, allow me, I would give the uh, word to my co-panelists uh, first, because I have been 
closely involved in the presentation of uh, in the preparation of this paper. So I'm very interested to hear the initial feedback and, and maybe get some feedback on the feedback rather than uh, rehashing our conclusions, which I believe, which I believe very strongly. So with your permission. Absolutely, and uh, hopefully this doesn't put you on the spot. We have the, also the co-authors and collaborators as well. Dr. Oh. <laughs> you know, it's so interesting. I was just supposed to be the timekeeper. I was informed that I just have to manage everybody's time. But now I've been put on a spot. Uh, I think the presentation, you know, has informed me, you know, about... Is it on? Oh. Okay. Is it... Can you hear me now? So the presentation, in fact, for an economist, this macroeconomic presentation is not a surprise, right? I mean, we know what needs to be done in terms of reforms, whether it is trade, governance, labor, product. We've been discussing it in various uh, discussions. We've been having several forums on this. But I think what is the twist, essentially, in this discussion today is the political timing of these reforms. You know, I mean, that is another set of issues. But where I think the discussion needs to be headed, and uh, I might just add to the presentation because commenting on such nice presentation would not add value. I'll just be repeating what they say. But you know, I was very recently teaching a class on macroeconomics of unbalanced growth. And I'll put it in the Indian context. Is it possible for India to double agricultural income and at the same time grow at 8 to 10 percent? Now, theoretically speaking, these are two tasks that, is, that are not compatible with each other. And the theoretical, and this was a paper that was written in 1967 called The Macroeconomics of Unbalanced Growth by Baumol when he pointed out that when you have two sectors in the economy that grow at different rates, Let's say agriculture, which has constant productivity. You look at the agricultural productivity in India, it's, it's changed, but not dramatically. And you look at other sectors in the economy where productivity is actually growing exponentially. So now if the government makes efforts to subsidize the constant productive sector, unfortunately, we have to sacrifice growth. So you can't have your cake and eat it too. You know, I mean, there are trade-offs involved in economics. So we have to determine, the political will needs to determine what is it that we want. Do we want to grow at 8 to 10 percent? Or do we want certain sections in society to be able to maintain a certain level of income? And unfortunately, when such income, I would, I mean, I'm not a political person, so I'm going to just say so. When you have incompatible agendas, unfortunately, trying to suppress economic forces. You know, several governments have tried it. India is not unique to it. It's happened across the world. You try to suppress the forces of demand and supply. Unfortunately, these forces in economics cannot be suppressed. And I must admit, I must give due credit to the IMF team that they have very politely stated something similar, that we have to take now what they have added to it is bold and safer reforms because Reforms has to be a part of the political agenda, but you cannot ignore people who will be affected by reforms, not because reforms are not needed, but politically they might make the reforms more feasible. But at the same time, we have to be cognizant that what is the agenda that we want to sort of encourage in the government. So if we want to promote a particular sector, then we have to sacrifice the other sectors in the economy. But if safety net means that in rural areas we need to provide health and education, provide a certain income security, but does not necessarily mean agricultural income security, then we are talking of a different reform agenda altogether for the country to pursue. So I think, uh, you know, I'll, bring, I'll talk more about uh, but, uh, this aspect as it comes out in the discussion. But I just want to highlight that we need to have compatible policy agendas. You can't have your cake and eat it too. It's not possible. Laws of economics will not permit it, no matter how hard you try to do so. Thank you very much. Thank you. I mean, the, the general cliche has always been a rising tide lifts all boats, but the, the nuance is not at the same speed. It's the same speed. So, uh, Mr. Bhattacharya. Thank you, uh, Mr. Tongia. Uh, am I audible?
Is it a yeah. catch? Yeah. yeah. Uh, is it clear? Can we just check it's on? Uh, the light. Oh, that's it. Yeah, now I'm audible. The other green light. <laughs> yeah, other green light. Yeah, that's right. No, I think I, what I would do in the next 10 minutes or so is trying to be an economic journalist, you know, instead of, you know, I'm, I'm not a professor or an academic. So I would like to be an economic journalist and try to, try to, uh, you know, uh, put the report's findings in some sort of an Indian or maybe you may call it an Asian perspective. Uh, I think the, 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 both the reports uh, actually, even though they were part of different publications, if I have understood it correctly, have uh, a remarkable uniformity of approach uh, and the broad uh, outline and the broad uh, messages that uh, they drive home are quite unquestionable and uh, nobody can have any quarrels with that, whether it is a bold or safer reforms, uh, uh, making policy space, stability, debt and deficits. Uh, relaxing financial sector norms to make sure that the private financial sector <coughs> norms actually get bread to play. Um, uh, private institutions liberalizing trade, um, infrastructure, investing in people, um, investing in human capital, focusing on the digital economy, uh, gender gap. These are all you know, the right buttons that have been pressed. You know, there's no question on that. So uh, while uh, no questions on all the basic parameters and the approach, uh, I will raise uh, um, uh, six broad questions which come to my mind after looking at this report. The first question uh, is, uh, is about, uh, about reforms. Do they, what is the connection with crisis? I mean, do reforms follow crisis or uh, reforms happen because of crisis or as uh, uh, one of the reports, your report said that reforms bring better results if economic conditions are better. So after looking at both the reports, I'm, I, I'm beginning to think if we look at the Indian experience, I think reforms have worked the best when we are actually economically worse off. We are in a crisis. And I can see that today we are not in a crisis, but I think uh, by Indian standards, by its potential, we are uh, probably heading towards a crisis. And you can see how a 5% growth rate in one quarter has actually driven the government to announcing uh, a corporation tax cut after 17 long years, you know, after having remained. So, so in, a, in, a, in a crisis-like situation, at least the Indian experiment is, ex experience is, that you act, you know. So if you uh, have good economic conditions, whether reforms get ushered in or not is something that I have my own questions about as far as India is concerned. So that's my first question. The second question is, uh, do reforms happen <coughs> with a strong government? I think that's a suggestion that has also been made that reforms can get implemented in a better way if you have a strong government, for the first two years of elections, you can get it done. Uh, I broadly agree with that suggestion, uh, but the question there would be, uh, what happens to a government which is strong and so confident and so committed to its political agenda and it's so hungry for acquiring more political capital that the economic concerns do not become of paramount importance compared to the political agenda. Now, and this is exactly probably <coughs> what has happened in India's case, where the government of the day is so strong on political capital, it is little wary of using that political capital for economic gains in my view, because it is afraid that that might undermine its political capital. You know, the, the logic of raising income tax rates for the rich is a classic example in this last budget of enhancing your political capital, even though it means that economically it did not make much sense. So is, is this idea that a strong government always gives you 
better reforms is something that I would like to, to review or debate a little more. The third point I would like to make is that has the political economy aspect of, of reforms, you know, whether it's a bolder reform or a safer reforms, has been understood clearly uh, in these papers. Because I do believe that the, the political economy aspects of, uh, of economic reforms or economic policy steps, that whatever you may like to do, uh, are something that probably are as complex uh, uh, as anything uh, that you have. I, I, I think no other country probably presents those complex challenges as India does. It's a diverse country. It's got diverse political groupings uh, uh, where uh, in spite of a huge agricultural distress, economic distress, uh, uh, you see uh, the political narrative is so strong that it can win you an election. So to what extent the role of political economy is, is important in, in charting a model that gives you more reforms and more growth. Uh, my fifth point is that uh, uh, there's a report talks about the importance of, uh, of uh, education, skills, and I think, uh, you know, while the Indian story uh, looked very good from the chart, but my sense is that there is a lot of scope for improvement there, and we haven't done enough on this education aspect of building skills. And probably, this takes me to my, my penultimate point, which is uh, actually the final point, that we are probably will be one of the only economy in the world which has moved to a services-led economy missing the manufacturing bus. This is a big question, and, and there are costs to it. And the costs in the sense that if you don't move, first be a manufacturing economy, and we are still struggling to raise our share of manufacturing from 16%, <coughs> but we are already are a services giant, so to say, if you look at the entire GDP composition. So are we going to be the first Indian global economy which has missed the manufacturing bus has gone to the services sector and did need not probably address some of the concerns that a manufacturing, growing manufacturing economy needs to do. So probably these are factors that uh, uh, should be discussed and debated when we talk about uh, South Asia or South Asian reforms, because India is a large part of South Asia. So with these, uh, I will end my brief comments at this stage. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, uh, these were very, very rich comments, um, and they were naturally focused more on India, given that we are in India. So allow me to comment on them um, with my head of uh, overseeing the work, the IMF's work on India also. Uh, as Manuela has pointed out, uh, some of the challenges in the rest of South Asia are fairly uh, are similar. Uh, some are different because the macroeconomic situation is different, but let me, let me mainly comment on, on, on points that I have heard here. I think the question of, of unbalanced growth obviously is an interesting one, but one should not underestimate you know, the regional divergences in other parts of the world. I mean, the US, for example, uh, even in, in Europe, there was a huge discussion about regions. So yes, I mean, the, the it, it is difficult once you, even if you grow in aggregate, but it is definitely much easier to address some of the questions if the, if the aggregates grow. And some of the issues that you mentioned, in particular with the agricultural sector, I think link back to some of the air aspects that are discussed in, in the paper and that we discuss in our work with, uh, um, with India. I mean, they're related to labor and product market land, uh, issues, land reforms. So the question, what holds back agricultural uh, productivity increase is closely linked to what's happening in the rest of the economy. So addressing some of the uh, structural problems will also facilitate uh, you know, the issue of the agriculture. And then it becomes one of 
of push and pull. Do you first need to improve agriculture to get the, the labor released for, for other sectors or the other way or the other way around? Having seen this in other countries, I, I believe <coughs> that the labor release will be fairly simple. One of some of the, these other issues have been addressed. So um, not notwithstanding, I think the, the question of, of, of enduring um, regional equality or, or similarity of living standards, I think it's nevertheless not wrong to look at, at the macro and macro situation uh, first. Um, now, some of the questions that you, Mr. Pachacharya, have left, I mean, are absolutely, absolutely uh, to the point. I mean, saying, yes, we have heard this before. Uh, what can we do to take this one, one step further? Um, and there, the issue of, of crisis, that do you need a crisis or do you not? Uh, do reforms happen with strong government or, or do they not happen? I think it goes back to the same question. It comes, reforms happen when there is a consensus. And what, what drives a consensus? Clearly in many countries, I mean, if you're in absolutely desperate situation, then it's easier to, to say, okay, there is nothing else we, we have to do it. But it does not have to be so. I mean, I, it really is a question of what drives the consensus and the question of whether a government can afford to, to as you put it, uh, pursue a political agenda while neglecting the economy. I, uh, it is probably possible if you grow at still a reasonable level, and uh, as many of you said, India is not in crisis, 5% growth is still a positive per capita growth, but at the same time when you look forward and you look at your regional comparators and 5% uh, could be uh, what it is that, uh, that is needed for a wake up call. So I think there is also a mandate for, for all of us here to, to show the urgency of, of what needs to be done. And you know, to some extent our paper is hopefully making some, some contribution to that. We also do our annual surveys of, of India, and as uh, my colleague, Mr. Breuer, said, it's going to be um, uh, discussed at the IMF board <coughs> in, in, uh, in end, end of November that makes some very strong recommendations to that it is the time for, for looking at growth is now. Um, and then the final question, whether India needs manufacturing or not, um, I think that is we, we speak very clearly to that in the paper. We think that the demographic situation in, in South Asia and, and India of needing <coughs> to absorb 150 million uh, people is, is, is not possible without a multi-pronged uh, approach. Uh, I think India is helped by the fact that you have a, a very big domestic market, a rising middle class uh, demand for, for products, but one needs to definitely look into what is holding the, the manufacturing sector back. And uh, in, in our work on, on India, I mean, there is many things that hinder firms from growing. Uh, so there is a, a, a number of, of low-hanging fruits of things that can, that can be done, but like in other cases and reform, there needs to be a, a consensus around what is, what is needed. And quite obviously, the success of India in the highest, high uh, value added services is remarkable. And whatever is being done should not endanger that uh, position that India has gained. Uh, so this is not certainly not what we are saying, but, but a, a more balanced type of sectoral growth would be needed. So let me stop with this, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing the audiences with uh, questions. Before we get to that, just one follow-up yeah. round. Um, we've heard, of course, this jobs issue being very yeah. critical, I mean, right. politically as well as otherwise, and the challenge, one on the <coughs> services side, but also future trends, mega trends, automation, robotics, AI, et cetera. And so these are things that have been sort of known in an abstract level. I'll tie this to another issue of data, 
Mm -hmm. uh, people talk of data being the new oil. Well, someone put it, I've, I've read that, you know, it's like a toddler. You can make it say anything that you want. And so these, the paper and a lot of studies are macro level. Right. And really drilling down, and where do the bottom up and the top down not align necessarily? Because you also alluded to one more fact that in South Asia especially, there's a lot of informal economy. So it doesn't get captured in the necessarily consistent manner, whether it's employment, whether it's time spent, wealth itself, whether it's black markets, gold, so many other factors and indicators are not consistently necessarily captured. And so subnationally, uh, is that the way forward for India? Is it, you know, to pick on your sort of view, is there that India's average could be faster if we allowed more heterogeneity? Or is that too politically unpalatable? I mean, that's one of the fundamental questions at a national to subnational level. Uh, hopefully, like you said, it's not an either or proposition. It's multiple strands and multiple threads that are pursued at once. This is a thing you opposed. <laughs> well, right yeah, now. This it started with data and subnational. Even this exercise, which has been put forth today, is a data exercise of cross country regressions. Now, different, these are countries which are at different stages of development, and therefore making comparisons sometimes has to be, you have to be a bit cautious about it. But, but the larger point, I think, essentially, which is coming out, even whether it is at the subnational level or the data, if, if I may say so, I mean, we're talking about economic growth. And if you look at the history of economic growth, it's actually not a norm for a country to grow. You know, if I'm a data scientist, growth has only happened in the last 200 years. You know, if at all, we have seen growth in the country. And in India, it's happened very recently. We had a Hindu period of growth, uh, Hindu rate of growth for 3%, and then after 90s. So it's not, you know, you can have political stability without growth. I mean, is it really very important? But I think there is an important question that if you want to uplift society from a poverty perspective, then growth essentially is very necessary. But look at the larger point they make with the data on trade liberalization. Now, I can, there are, you can handpick countries that have grown exponentially. You can literally handpick them. They are not a norm at all. Let's start with America's trade liberalization history. Hamilton <laughs> opposed it. America accepted it. They had an infant trade argument, which is we're going to protect our industry, but we want the export markets. After that was Germany, which was under pressure from colonial empires in the 19th century under Bismarck, did the same thing. Meiji restoration under Japan did the same thing, protecting the domestic industry. But all these guys produced industries that became world class. So the protection lasted only for a certain period of time. Then you come into the modern period. In the modern period, we talk about Japan growing. Of course, we had Germany, which had followed. Then in the modern period, the exponential growth has come from South Korea. Again, the same thing. You had the infant trade, import, there were tariffs, exports, they wanted freedom for being able to export for a world class. Then once again, they moved fast. And China has done exactly the same thing. So now, if I have to look at trade liberalization and growth from a historical perspective, and these are the countries that have actually exponentially grown. I mean, in the sense, I'm telling you about from countries where they were. You look at even countries like Finland. You know, you'll be surprised to know Finland lost more people in the war as a percentage of population than any country during Second World War. In, from, they, had a rush, they were fighting a war with Russia in 1941. Now, how did Finland go? It was a poor country then. They recognized very quickly they had to play Russia at one end from a political angle because Russia, they have a huge border with Russia. And fortunately for them, a historical event emerged in the form of NATO, in the form of uh, the Western country, which are trying to contain the Russian Empire. But they had protection. So you see, at the end of the day, if I were to historically take the historical evidence on trade, it is basically I would draw a different conclusion that trade liberalization is good. Trade liberalization, yes, with the caveat that you have to take. So yes, you're right about how data can spin various stories, can spin, but if we were to truly believe in history of economic growth and be able to interpret events, and let me give you another story, and this time it came from a journalist. I was interested in what happened to Iran when it suddenly became rich in 1972. The oil prices quadrupled at that point in time. Shah's revenues were $5 billion, and he wanted $20 billion of revenues he was getting annually. You would have expected Iran to actually become 
you know, he said in his speech that I will build a great civilization in 10 years. What takes countries hundreds of years, I'll do it in 10 years. And it was a major fiasco which eventually led to the revolution in 1979. But was he not trying to modernize? He was trying to modernize. Certainly, he was trying to import factories from the West, literally import factories. But then he didn't have ports to bring in the equipment. So now he didn't have the ports. Certainly, he realized he didn't have the roads to take the equipment. Then he suddenly realized that I don't have the lorry drivers to take the equipment once he built the road to the other pit as a result of it. The entire wealth that they were producing went waste. And unfortunately, it created a scenario where, because he didn't have domestic workers to build on these uh, equipments that he was working, it created various political scenarios, which unfortunately, at that point in time, stalled all the reform. But what's really interesting is that why did it work? Why did this relationship work in South Korea, the Americans' relationship with South Korea? Why did it fail in Iran? So I think when we talk about growth, these, I think, studies are extremely important to point out. For example, in the study, when they talk about the governance structure, now, their story is not wrong. I mean, governance structure is extremely, extremely important. You simply cannot purchase growth. You cannot buy growth. No matter if we discover something today in India and think that we can buy growth, it's practically impossible. It's actually ruined countries. So I take their paper a little bit more seriously in the historical context. When, Jovan, you make the point about governance, it's a serious, serious issue. The question is, do we have the political will to introduce uh, the governance reforms that are much needed. And I think that's a big question from a historical perspective, Rahul. Ab so. ab absolutely. And I didn't hopefully <coughs> imply that the data was wrong, just that what else do we need mm -hmm. to take the story from the macro? I'm more just more interpreting yeah. the data very differently. Yeah. You know, that's, I think, the very yeah. crucial thing. It's not that the data is wrong, but the story it tells are also man-made. Data is not man-made. Data is being produced by a system. But the stories around it are always man-made, and that requires very careful thinking from various sources. And I'm glad that we have a journalist sitting here, no. because a lot of my economic understanding on issues has actually come from guys reading guys like Kapunski. Uh, I'm not pronouncing it correctly, but a Polish author, when he wrote about the Shah of Shahs, I learned much economics from there, because you're just recording historical events going on in a country which suddenly became rich and became disastrous in the next five, six years. It ruined everything for them. So. Well, you know, I mean, I think if you are talking about states, you know, my, my sense is uh, if you're looking at India, and I will be brief, I understand we are running out of time. Yeah. Uh, if you're looking at India, I think uh, in spite of the prime minister talking about how states should, you know, uh, get together and try to help India, the country, achieve higher growth, uh, I don't see uh, that awareness as yet seeping through the state level. Uh, you know, uh, remember the states, uh, combined states, uh, have an economic clout, uh, which is uh, one and a half times more than the center's financial clout. So states are very, very important in a country of India's size and diversity. Uh, we often underestimate the importance of the state machinery to bring about policy change. Uh, and uh, a lot of focus attention is in the center, but little attention goes to the states. Uh, so much so uh, that uh, I think it is a public comment that the 15th Finance Commission uh, Chairman, Mr. N.K. Singh, made at a recent meeting where I was there. Uh, so I, I, I think I could take the liberty of quoting him. Uh, what he said was that as the Finance Commission Chairman, and the Finance Commission holds consultation with all the state chief ministers, and he said, that out of 29 states he visited as a 15th finance commission, not one chief minister raised the issue of exports with him. Now, now they did raise the issue of tourism, but not one of them raised the issue of, of exports. Now imagine, I mean, what exports uh, can play, the, the kind of role it can play in manufacturing, or vice versa. So if you have 29 states not worrying about exports and how to make exports uh, a, a productive, profitable enterprise. Uh, so are we missing the entire uh, story by focusing too much on the center, which is, as I said, that uh, you know, now a, a smaller portion uh, of the larger Indian economic uh, GDP? So, 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 so that's, uh, that's the point I would like to make. Thank you.
Uh, maybe very, very yeah, briefly only we'll because you yeah. mentioned uh, the export-led growth, uh, you, you mentioned exports. I think one, one point we are, we are making in our paper is that it has worked for other countries, it has been, had remarkable success, but we need to see the context and the global context is one where those countries that have taken up a lot of those exports are growing to grow much, much slower. So, so export-led growth uh, by itself is not a recommendation that we have for India. Mm. We, coming back to the multi-prompt where the domestic market will have to play an important role. Absolutely. I'd like to open it up for a uh, lot of hands are there. So what we'll do is we'll try and go through them. Um, if you could just keep it as short as possible, introduce yourself just one second. Let's start with there and then go to the far left and then here. So uh, if, yeah. 